Welcome to the Speak Her Podcast with your host, Camille Essick, the podcast where innovators and creators connect. Let's get started. This is your girl, Camille Essick. I am the host of the Speak Her Podcast. This is the podcast where innovators and creators connect. Be sure to hit that notification button and subscribe right now on my YouTube channel. I'm also on Instagram at Camille.Essick and all of my merch is available on my website at chemistryroomfragrances.com. If you subscribe, you can save 10% um, by using the code thank you 10 or save 15% as a subscriber by using the coupon code GBM15. So go out and grab that merch right now. And the scent of the evening is lavender vanilla. I brought it back just in time for summer. So go ahead and grab that. And with that, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get the show started. I have have my brother he's a friend to show a very very familiar face he is always bringing something to the table you may know him as the party guy the one and only <laughs> Antoine Aiken and we also have Dr. Whit with Dr. Whitney McClure is here she returned if you were at heart and soul uh the soul conversations back in February we did the singles night she was here representing for the ladies and she was so dope I had to bring her back and she's wearing her good black men t-shirt as well so that for their dudes, yes, I want to say thank you here. So um, for those that are not familiar with you, uh, Dr. Whitney, if they missed that conversation from before, oh, so Ty, please introduce yourself again. Hello, hello. I am Dr. Whitney. It's actually McCurry, my bad. Um, I am a teacher. I'm an educational consultant. I work primarily with students who have high behavior needs, um, social emotional needs. And things of that nature, I train teachers, Um, I consult with schools, with classrooms, with anybody who wants to talk about children and education and how to make it more equitable. I'm your girl. She is. And be sure to follow her on Instagram as well. Um, She has a lot of great content, very informative. So be sure to follow Dr. Whitney. And my brother is back, Dr. Antoine. Uh, Keep calling him Dr. Antoine because I think he's going to get his PhD. So we're going to call him. Dr. A. Uh, Antoine is in the building. He's like, no. But Antoine, welcome back. Again. Please reintroduce yourself. He said he is done with school. Okay. <laughs> welcome I'm back. So again. done with school. Um, yeah. I'm Antoine Aiken. I am a psychotherapist by profession. Um, and I'm also an entrepreneur in the restaurant industry. What is your restaurant? Oh, sorry. I have uh, two subway locations so far and and some other things in the works. Okay, something else. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Um, I'm here for it. So we're just going to get into the weeds of everything. The reason why I brought them both here, just because there are so many questions, a reoccurring question I've had, um, on discussions on and offline about mental health representation. Should I get a black therapist? Why should I get someone that looks like me going into therapy? So I did want to have that conversation tonight amongst some other things. So first I do want to start off saying that um, this is strictly uh, our opinion. We're not like, you know, saying this is what you have to do. We're just kind of giving some information out there and then kind of help you make a better um, have some better information, more information in the decision-making process as far as your mental health we- wellness and care plans. I did want to put that out there. But for me, I think it's very important, um, at least for me, uh, when I was selecting my therapist, to have someone that does look like me just because I feel like it was someone that I could relate to as far as um, within the culture of being a Black woman and so- social con- constructs and just in conversation, just in words we use every day in jargon, um, when communicating and having someone that will understand um, some of the experiences that we have in life. Um, so we're going to start with Dr. Witt. Uh, what do you have to say about the selection process? Well, let's kind of wind back. Uh, let's touch on first the importance of uh, having representation. And, and Antoine, please chime in. In the world of mental health, how, how uh, representation is very important. Well, I think one of the things that you just said was having someone who understands and knows the culture right offhand. Um, And so I've actually had two therapists. One was not a a Black female, and my current one is. And so with my first one, it was I had to stop, and I spent more time explaining what I was attempting to say as opposed to my second one who can weed out and weed through exactly what I'm saying 
as I say it, because she understands what, what it's like to number one, be black, but to be a, a woman of color. Um, mm-hmm. So with that process, it, it took several visits with the first because I wanted to be open. I don't want to be biased and say, oh, you have to go with someone who looks like you. But I know that from personal experience, having mm-hmm. someone that looks like me benefited me. It, it gave me the most benefit within like two sessions. We're already mm-hmm. breaking down walls. We're already on learning habits. We're already combing through um, childhood experiences. And that's just second time meeting her. There was this sense of familiar spirit, kindred spirit, and she's also a Christian. So there's also this discernment. And so she's able to help me again, maneuver through things much more quickly than with my previous therapist. So with representation, again, I didn't go into it looking for, I definitely want to have someone that looks like me, but I found that once I was there, it's an absolute to have someone who looks like me, who understands what I'm saying, who can relate to what I'm saying, but who can also call me and speak back to me the way that I need to be um, spoken to. So. I love that. What about you, Antoine? So I have kind of a different perspective. Okay. Um, So first, as a therapist, I understand representation a lot because I think a lot of um, clients and patients that I've seen throughout my own practice come to me with the same thing that Dr. Witt just talked about. The fact that I'm a Black male, I'm immediately relatable to other Black male clients and even Black females that have, may have had negative experiences with Black males. Um, my mere presence as being somebody that looks like them, I look a little bit younger than I probably am at times, um, and my language can be very relatable, and I think that that's usually a source of comfort for them. For me personally, when I'm in therapy, I don't want somebody that looks like me, um, because the people that look like me have also been the people that have been part of my trauma. Um, so when I have been in situations where I've where I've tried to do something with somebody that looks like me, I find myself over identifying um, and I find myself kind of making excuses for certain things. It just wasn't a good dynamic. What was a good dynamic was somebody that didn't really understand somebody that didn't understand but could empathize with the black experience and I could get a totally different perspective that I can't get in my personal circle. My personal circle looks and feels just like me, um, but this individual was not a part of my culture. It was a white middle-aged female that was very progressive, very liberal. And it was just helpful to get another person's perspective because all of my perspective is people that are like me and I just wanted a different perspective. That's interesting. I think for me, the one of the reasons why I chose the therapist um, that I use, I've had her, you know, for many years. And um, one, I didn't want to start over having to go back and catch someone up, you know, that. And then mm-hmm. two, just for me, I just my experiences, I guess, opposite of you, Antoine, that I've had with white women in professional spaces, it's been um, um, microaggressive and at times traumatizing. So, so to sit mm-hmm. in a space, where I, it's subconsciously I feel like this person is scrutinizing me scrutinizing me and that that sense the same reason why you didn't choose one is the reason why I chose one um mm. and then to just having that sense of within a professional sense sisterhood but the reason why I did choose um the, the person that I use is the total you know same reason but the opposite reason of why you didn't so yeah and I think that just just to piggyback on that, I think that the important part of this conversation is that all three of us chose or pursued for different reasons. Like you got to really understand who you are. It's not cookie cutter because somebody could have an opinion similar to me and somebody can have an opinion similar to you, Camille. So it's you really got to understand you. Um, and really be able to test it out because you may have one bad experience with a Black therapist and then say, well, I don't want another Black therapist, but that could just be one isolated experience. Exactly. Like, you really got to try it out. Yeah. I've always said it's like 
dating, you know, um, because someone's asked me like, well, I want, you know, to get a therapist, but I don't know how to select one and just tell them on my business and it doesn't work out. And I always use the analogy like, you know, the first few dates, like it's just a, hey, do I get a warm fuzzy or do I feel a red flag? Mm -hmm. You know, just the chemistry. And you can do that in one or two conversations and, and make the decision. Hey, this is not for me. But if you, after a couple of sessions, realizing like, hey, um, I kind of feel something here. Let's see where this goes. Then that is your chance or opportunity to pursue. And then in the first couple of sessions where you do decide, hey, this is the one, you're still not going to put everything out there. It's just, again, very, it's, it's like dating. You're building a relationship and, and you're having to build trust with this person. And once you realize like, hey, you know, this feels safe, uh, and you get that, um, you'll know because then you're stop. You'll begin to do what I call dumping. It'll just start coming out. But mm-hmm. in the beginning, no, you're not just going to just open the floodgates in the first couple of sessions. I think right. one of the right. things that really drew me to my current one um, mm-hmm. is my first therapist. She, everything I said was so amazing. It was so mm-hmm. awestruck. It could be that oh, I graduated from high school. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm so proud of you. And I'm thinking to myself, because I'm a numbers girl. And I know, I I, have, I really literally have some odds against me. I know what they are. But it was, oh my gosh, you graduated. Oh my gosh, you did this. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I'm like, this is literally what the Lord and I, you know, we discussed. So it's not anything that's this is basic to me. Basic. I'm like, this is basic. It's not even anything that traumatic. Ma'am, you can't be in awe because I finished high school. Like, again, that's 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 a given. That's that's the purpose of going. Yeah, and so and then going back to that, um, and I listened to Dio Hughley a lot, and he said something before. He was like he made the comment, he said, the most dangerous place for a black person to live is the imagination of a white person. And there has been time and spaces, me just being myself, I've had counterparts come to me like, like you said, oh, that's amazing. Or, oh, well, you speak so well. And I would say, well, we are in America. Um, our part, uh, predominant language is English. So what's a, what is awestruck you know what's shocking about that and and those little things or uh, where do you get your clothes from or you just look so nice every day and i'm thinking (laughs) well how else am i supposed to look coming to work you know and and those things so that those little things it's like a nails on the chalkboard for me and so if i deal with that for free i'm not gonna pay you and I'm dealing with that in the back of my mind even though you may not be doing it but that's my own thing you know so and it just makes me uncomfortable so that's why I opted not to that way I would just feel emotionally safe in that space do y'all feel like that is unique to the the race or the gender like is that more of a white woman thing or do y'all see that with white and um with white male and female I think it's a, a gender thing because I would say 90% of the time, if not more, white men like me. You know, right. I get along well with them. Comp- oh, <laughs> Bill, you know, I know how to do that. Um, Cold switching in the workplace, another conversation. But <laughs> it is true. But it's just like, but it, with the women, for me, I've noticed uh, it t- has tend to be... Um, tight i'll say i'll use that word it's been tight or i find myself kind of like you know mm. so yeah i've had some in times past now pretty cool but in times past even now i'm still kind of on guard but in times past it's been tight (laughs) what about you with absolutely um gender i i think it's more so gender than just male, I mean, it's female, sorry, as opposed to male. With the men, again, it's, oh, hey, it's just Whitney. It's just Whitney. But when I'm in those spaces with the, like, females, it's Whitney the blank. Whitney the, you know, oh, Whitney, you ha- always have something to say. And it's like a, a gut punch, but sometimes they're like, shut up. And I'm like, well, yeah. what's going on here? Um, and so with the guys, it's just, I'm just Whitney. I'm not... 
any other thing. I'm not the black Whitney. I'm just Whitney. Yeah, and and, and we're gonna circle back, but just for example, um, Antoine, um, I was living in California, working, and uh, one of my supervisors, white male, we got along really well. And then I went to the office across the hall, and so then the person I was working with, um, that was a very interesting situation. Lots of microaggressions. And so even though I wasn't no longer working with him directly, he would sometimes come over just to say, hey, see how I was doing. And this particular time, she was in her office working. And so he came into, it was like my office was in the office and then she had an inner office, if that makes sense. So he comes into um, my space and we're talking, having a conversation. And then she just comes out and just hops right in the conversation, interrupts everything. He kind of looks at me like, glaring eyes like is this broad serious and just really she just bombards the conversation like i'm not even there and then she's like oh come into my office like and this happened more than once and he looked at me and he goes he like he mouthed that to me i was like it's cool we can talk later but it was like i noticed a pattern anytime he would come to speak to me it would drive her nuts and she would literally come out and in the conversation or hop in the conversation or butt in the conversation and you could see the uh the um annoyance on his face and he just really wanted to be like what is this chick's problem and I thought to myself I I'm seeing what this is and so and from that point forward when he would speak to me he would ask me like oh is someone so around I'm like oh no she's gone and then he would come by and it wasn't anything unprofessional just chat you know and yeah that's how that went it was a very interesting interesting dynamic so So moving right along, <laughs> the awkward silence. Antoine, did you have anything on that? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, wait. No, we're no. good. Okay, cool. Yeah. We're going to move right along because that was awkward. So <laughs> I do want to get into the navigation of mental health within the current social climate. Um, we see so many things on the news right now, uh, particularly the overturning of Roe v. Wade. We see mm-hmm. you know, videos of Karens every day in addition to just the day-to-day norms. So how do we as Black people, and I'll answer on, we've had conversations before about how um, Black men are um, misperceived and being labeled as showing up aggressively. And I do want to carry this conversation because now we're in a space where people online are just open about their feelings on both sides of the spectrum. So how do you guys feel like, how do we navigate this space as people of color when we see this stuff on social media, like, all the time, like all the time. I think for me, one of the things that I I have to do is I have to turn off my notifications. I have to turn like strictly everything off, only content, only relevant information. Um, especially like over the past weekend, I was in the mountains, so I didn't have a lot of reception, anyways. But mm-hmm. to get the ruling, to see what people are saying, I immediately have to distance myself because I know that it sends me in a headspace. That makes me want to act out of character. So for me, one of my things is I I focus on the here and the now. Like, and I know like with anxiety, um, it just goes it goes through the roof for me personally. So I figure out what's what's going to be most important, and I focus on those things, and I slowly filter in the the outside world. So for me, again, I, notifications on phone, all social media, it'll be whoever really needs to get in contact with me when those times come, like last week, they know how to reach me. They know where to find me. They can get into my house if need be. Um, But for me, it's one of those things, what's most important for me, what's going to be best for my mental health, what's going to help me uh, navigate the the streets like right now. Um, I want to be outside, but is it safe to be outside? You know, how can I be outside safely? (laughs) Yeah. That's a good point with the shootings we've had lately. Um, Antoine, what about you? Because that also ties into another question I do want to ask as far as we've all experienced trauma past, even right now, currently, how does that tie into our ability to make decisions and and making decisions like where do we go to shop, even past trauma as far as how do we date, you know, and that's something I do want to get to. But what about you, um, Antoine, as far as navigating social media and, and, just monitoring or managing mental health right now? 
I think that it's important to always keep into perspective that social media is a glimpse into real life. <clears throat> and social media does not always represent what real life is to me. And I think that sometimes when we look at social media, we start seeing the experiences of other people and we feel like we need to take on those problems and take on those issues. Um, and sometimes we can, but then other times we have to recognize that this is not my fight. I want to be helpful but for my mental health, this is not a fight because this is not something that's impacting my everyday right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we can, we can, we all have a responsibility to do what we need to do to fight for other people that for whatever reason cannot fight for themselves. But we also have to recognize when it's time for us to pull back and focus on us. And I I promote selfishness. Um, I don't know if me and you have talked about that, Camille, but I promote selfishness because I Let's think about that, that. That's, that's a good point. Let's <clears throat> bring that in. Yeah, I, I just think that for for me, being selfish has really helped me get to where I am today. And I think that I've been selfish in a selfless way. I think that the people around me and the people close to me would be surprised that I would call myself selfish. Um, but I am. I prioritize myself. It's that whole helicopter perspective where they say, save yourself before you can save anyone else. I truly value that. There's going to be certain times where I cannot show up 100% for you because I have to focus on me. And then once I get myself together, then I will divvy out how I can prioritize other things in my life. But I, I, I promote being selfish because um, I feel like that's how you get the best you. I like that. Um, your emergency is not a, my emergency. That's something I've learned to do recently um, in the last few months. I've been more um, selfish with my time as far as um, if someone calls when I answer, is it important? Text message. You know, before, every time my phone was going off, I'm grabbing my phone. But if I'm doing something that's more important as far as myself, if I'm doing something at home, if I'm working on something, and I know it's not pressing. I'll get back to you. Um, I, for me personally, I set a time as far as when I put my phone on do not disturb now. So, um, except for when I'm podcasting like tonight, but on a regular night around eight thirty or nine, I put my phone on do not disturb. That way, I have time for my mind to wind down from the business of the day. Because if you're just on your phone, on your phone, and then you're trying to go to sleep. Your mind takes longer to run, to shut down or go to bed. So I start prepping myself like, hey, um, it's evening time. It's time to start quieting things down. So I start doing that around 830. I light my candles, you know, my aromatherapy, chemistry room fragrances. And I start getting things quiet because I know, hey, Cam, it's time to settle down. And usually when I do that about 930 or so, 945, I'm prepping for bed it's time to go because i have a full day the next day and i notice the days that i prolong that um i'm not at my best the next day so the days i do implement that and been more disciplined i'm sleeping better i'm sleeping throughout the night and i feel more refreshed in the morning so antoine i absolutely love that about being selfish with your time selfishly selfish i love that um dr witt I was really quick before Dr. Wick goes. One of the things that I wanted to say to um, a point that you just made, mental health is not new. Like mental health has been around for a very long time. Um, but in today's world, we're seeing the manifestation of bad mental health more, you know, increases in things like suicidality, um, depression, anxiety. And in my opinion, I think a lot of that is to what you just said, that self-care. We don't take care of ourselves. People in history did a better job of taking care of themselves. They had just as hard of lives as we got. They had probably even harder lives, um, but they did a better job of taking care of themselves in a sense that they weren't 24-7 available to people. They didn't pack their day from start to finish. They didn't prioritize things like team no sleep, team always booked and busy. Those are things that we promote and we glamorize, but I think that it's causing a lot of mental health issues. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Witt. I just had to get that out. 
<laughs> no, and that's great. Um, so that's one thing that I literally, I've spent years working on. So okay. for me to turn my phone off, for me to DND everybody, um, except my favorites, that's something literally that I've had to work through with my therapist, with my mentor, with my parents. Not that anyone is forcing me to do anything. It's that I feel it's my responsibility to be available for X, Y, Z. I feel it's my responsibility to handle A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And sometimes it is. Um, but at the same time, most of the time it's not. And so that's just something that I picked up as I was going along, you know, trying to make sure that everyone else was happy. Um, I used to be a people pleaser. Praise God that we we done with that. Um, and so I know that firsthand when I'm making those decisions, can, do I have time? Do I have the mental capacity? Um, is this going to serve me as well as the other people? Like sometimes I literally turn down things mm-hmm. because I know it won't serve. I won't show up as my full self. I turned down the whole job that I wanted because I understood I could not show up as my full self at that time. Um so with that being said, it's like you, you can't pour from an empty cup. It's always you cannot pour from an empty cup. People get the overflow. You have to take care of you. So that's 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 something we, we are continually working on. And something that I try to teach my children at school, um, all the children at school, I have about 2,000 students in my wow. building. And so I'll work with all of them at some point, some really high achievers, some that are barely going to make it some that I don't choose to not make it. Um, But that's the thing, like, you can't overextend yourself to make one of those comfortable. You can't overextend yourself to make sure their social media is popping. You can't overextend yourself, you know, to make sure the TikToks are coming out in the right order. Those are just things that that people want to do, and that's not a priority if it's not your priority. If it is, go on with it. If it's not, pull away and be fine with it. It's okay. I love it, too. Something you touched on, Antoine, when you mentioned that social media is just a glimpse into reality. And I think some people have gotten so fixated, they forget that social media is that. It's just a highlight reel, right? It's just a blurb, a snapshot. Um, We see someone post a picture from a photo shoot, and they could have taken that picture six months ago. But we think it's right now, it's right then, and (laughs) I've done it. Like, I've taken a picture and then posted it two months later just mm-hmm. to have fresh content because, you know, we don't waste our our shots, as Mark says, you know. But in reality, you don't know when that person took that picture. A few um, years ago, there was a young lady. She got busted because um, she was doing these uh, new uh, reveals or makeovers. So, oh, guys, look, I just redid my kitchen. Oh, my guys, oh, look, I ma- made my living room over again um, doing a new uh, reveal. And I found out she was going to different Ikeas and taking photos at the display. <laughs> <laughs> like, I cannot make this I up. This is like the, the displays and doing the, the coffee counter in the kitchen and, and mm. people are just you know, because all you need is a good iPhone. Who's going to know, right? right, right. They'll never know. Right? Right. They're not going to know. Yeah, <laughs> who's going to know? And she was doing that. And so someone called her out mm-hmm. on it. Just for example, um, Bow Wow, he was doing photo shoots like uh, catching flights, not feelings, and finding out he was just renting someone's jet and taking pictures as if he was going somewhere mm-hmm. in, the, in the planes on the tarmac. You know, so mm-hmm. we compare ourselves to people doing things, posting on social media, like, oh my God, look at her Louis Vuitton bag. And it's probably a knockoff from Canal Street up in New York. I mean, just being honest. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so it's like, it creates a stress, it creates a mania. It also creates a depression because now you're comparing your achievements, your life or whatever you you have going on to something that may not even be true at all. I agree. And I think that I, Social media, so I don't know, I I really struggle with this because social media is not a distraction for me. And I think that a lot of people say that it is for them. And I have friends that will do like a detox from social media and say how beneficial it is. It, It just isn't that for me. Like, I guess I go into it recognizing that even in my own social media, I put out the content that I want people to have access to. And most of my content shows me having fun, 
turn it up. Yeah. Um, or, or something about me being successful. I don't put out content that is disparaging to me. That's just how I choose to represent my brand. People make those kind of decisions for their own personal pages all the time. So I guess I go into it thinking that somebody's social media is only going to be such a small fraction of who that person really is. Um, so it's it's hard to be envious of something when you don't know the whole picture or it's hard to be, you know, it's hard to feel away when you know that you're only getting a glimpse of, of that person's experience based on their life and what they've been through and so many other things. To your point with the Gucci bag, uh, I went and bought some Gucci shoes recently and I know that there's some other people that would have like posted them walking out the store with the bag and like, and that's, that's fine for them because that's the image that they want to put out. And that's the story that they want to tell. That's not the story that I want to tell. And it's like, that's okay. And I, and I agree with you on that. Cause I've purchased higher end products as well, but I don't, I just got something for my birthday. Yeah. You'll, you'll see her next time you see me. But <laughs> she's pretty cool. She's so cool. <laughs> it, we need a sneak peek. We need me. Adults in the room. Okay, it was my birthday. I had to. Okay, <laughs> but I digress. But I did that for me. But I don't feel the need to post that or blast that on social media. Like you said, that's something I did for myself. But what does that really have to do with the total narrative of who Camille is on social media? Because for me, my space is primarily, primarily for promoting chemistry room fragrances, my podcast, my eBooks. It's, it's more of, um, I look at it as advertising. Now, TikTok, I have fun, joke around Twitter. You know, I, I post articles. Um, we may discuss a TV show and that's my other outlet, but my main uh, lines of social media is primarily just, for, uh, hey, I'm here, social media, uh, follow me on YouTube, subscribe, that narrative, you know, building an audience, because I do want you to listen to my podcast and purchase my products. So it's more of a, a campaign line uh, lane for me, like you said, and I don't really post personal things, because again, the things that I find most precious to me, I tend to hold that, you know, to myself. I, if I do take a trip or do something fun, I'll post that. But like you, Antoine, I'm we're pretty much in the same vein as far as uh, what I post. Now, if I do something fun, that'll be in my timeline uh, on my stories or whatever. But yeah, it's pretty much just um, branding. Uh, you, Dr. Witt? So I don't have a lot of family that lives local. Um, okay. So that's, you know, it's like my digital photo album for the kids growing up or events that we have going mm -hmm. um for connecting with new professionals and things of that nature. But again, I also grew up with social media. So I grew up with, you have to have the college um, email to sign up. And so at that mm -hmm. time, it's just like, hey, what are my friends in college doing? Okay, oh, we're gonna go to this event. Oh, we can do this. And at one point though, I was in a relationship and he was like, um, sis, you spend way too much on way too much time on your phone, way too much time on social media. And I'm like, no, I don't. And he said, Yes, you do. Um, so I did a little research on myself and I absolutely did. Like it just it's like a, a mindless thing. It's just something to release my mind. So it's not that I'm necessarily comparing, but it's just like a release to see, oh. That's cute. Oh, what's the latest trend? Oh, I can style this this way. Um, and I can show my kids to those people who don't get to see them. Because, you know, we're not walking around with photo albums saying, here are my babies, look at what we did. It's like, yeah. hey, mom and dad, we did this. Let me tag you so you can see it. Hey, auntie, hey, let me show you this so you can make sure we get that gift to you on time or so stuff like that. So at this point in my life, I think I do have a healthier balance. Um, and I do set a timer on my phone so that when my time mm -hmm. is up, you know, I, I devote about an hour and a half. And so when my time is up, I can make a choice to keep going or I can just be done with it for the day. Because, that's you know, I can stick to my boundaries. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. good. I never thought about putting a timer on your phone when you're on there. That's a really good idea for someone if they're trying to scale back on the hours. I know. I'm an Apple user and it has um, the weekly, your screen time. Well, it's <laughs> you so know hard looking at it. It's so hard. <laughs> it's, at it. I'm ashamed someday. 
Mine is pretty good. It'll tell me like your time's decreased um, 12% or it's been up this week. Um, and getting those notifications, it's like, Ugh, where am I? But I, I think those are good to have. The timer ideal, I really like putting the timer. I think that's really cool. Um, as far as my uh, relationship with social media, I've been on both ends where it's just like that. And then now I'm in a space. Uh, once I realized like, Cam, you have spent too much time on the phone. And now I'm uh, having those curfews just within myself saying by a certain time, put my phone down um, in the morning um, as far as when I answer a phone call or text, you know, after 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Because in the morning, that's my devotion time where I'm listening to a sermon, whatever I'm doing in the morning to get myself spiritually prepared for the day. And so I know that I'm not going to call and text until after a certain time just because I need that time because I don't know what's going to happen when I walk out of the door. And so just to have myself centered to deal with the day, that's just something that I do. Um, and then I do want to uh, get off into another topic because um, I don't want to stay here too, too long um, because it is a very interesting topic. But um, in the field of mental health, um, and Antoine, you can probably start this one off as far as when dealing with um, clients um, and people that you sit down and talk with and them realizing that the choices that the decisions they made as far as how they chosen a job or dynamics with friendships or relationships, how past traumas impact our decision-making? Um, yes, yes. So I definitely can speak to that. Um, one of the things when I'm working with a lot of clients, um, I, I talk a lot about ownership and power. And I think that we have been socially conditioned to think that power is a bad thing. Like when we talk about power, we obvi- we oftentimes will talk about it in a sense of like over abusive power or using too much power. I talk about power in a sense that I think a lot of times we give power to people in situations that don't deserve as much power as we give them. Um, so I talk a lot about power and I talk about it from the perspective of you have control over your life. There's so many things in our life that we literally have control over, but we've been conditioned to think that we don't have control over these things. And a lot of times it is because of situations like past trauma. Um, past trauma will determine how we make situ- how we make certain choices because of other things that we've been through in the past. And now that's made us feel like I don't have options when you do have options. You have the option to do this. You have the option to do that. Um, But because of our past trauma, we limit some of the options that we give ourselves. And it's funny that when I walk through that with clients and really walk through them, what does power mean to you? Like, what are the things that you feel like you have control over? Some of the things that people don't even realize that they're giving control to something or someone else and they didn't even realize it. Wow. What about you, Dr. Witt? I'm sorry, I got some feedback. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I got caught up on what does power mean to you, Antoine. So I'm coming back. I'm Uh-oh. coming back to that. I need. I, I think no, I need you. Good. To- I mean, he really. Every time he comes on here, he drops the mic, and I'm just like, did he just really just say that? Like, wow. Camille, you even know, um, just growing up in the church, like. So many of those decisions, and I'm a PK, Me too. Um, we did and didn't do things because we weren't told that we could or couldn't do them. There was a lot of power that we gave up. So that manifest in adulthood decisions that we like, no, let's I open don't up the do doors it. box. Let's go. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I actually don't have to do this. Like, if I don't want to do this, and if I feel like doing this thing does not serve me anymore. I actually don't have to do this. And that can be such a releasing experience when you realize all of the stuff that you don't have to do because it's like, I'm in control. I have the power. If I don't want to do it, I don't have to do it. There's nothing forcing me to do that other than me having convinced myself this is what I have to do. Oh, my God. That's why. This is why you're here. This is why you're here. 
Come on, sis. Come on. We, we just ripped the baby off. Let's go. Let's go. I'm sorry. I want to stay on topic, but I forgot my response because I'm down the street and around the corner. You need to catch that people uh, often because that was a whole Look, story. you have a choice. Mm-hmm. All right. Try to remind me of the original question. So, okay, let's break it down because he he just changed the, he just changed the whole narrative for the last. Okay, so the initial point was past um, traumas, how it impacts your decision making. We're gonna start there, then we're gonna go skip on to that next that next uh, bomb he dropped on us. Um. <laughs> So past decision making and how does it impact? I mean, past trauma. How does it impact? Impacting yeah. decision making. Yes. Whew. So um, again, I'm gonna I'm jump into the into the education field because that's my bag. Um, we will have students walk into classrooms. We'll have teachers walk into classrooms, and they've had a particular experience because they are pick your poison because they're male because they're female because they're Asian, black, white. Um, whatever. And so when they get to that classroom, they have already predetermined what their experience is going to be in that classroom. So oftentimes I'll have to literally walk through that past trauma. And again, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a mental health um, professional, medical professional. I don't diagnose, but I Mm -hmm. sit with those kids and I go through exactly what they think is about to happen. And we dissect why they think that is about to happen but the flip side of that is that's not what has to happen so you have a choice as Antoine was just saying and what you want to happen you can come in with that past trauma and tack it on and make whatever that that teacher um, treats you a certain type of way you can remove yourself from those specific students you can do whatever you've done in the past and that will work for you but that will not get you the results that you want Ultimately, you want to come in there, you want to learn what you want to learn, meet who you're going to meet, and you want to be great. Um, so in the education field, that's literally, I do that 90% of the time. 90% of my days are spent walking through past traumas within the education field. And some of those come from our house. They come from our community. Um, oftentimes, they come from within the school and the system. And so we walk through, hey what's happened in the past? Hey, what do I want to see? What steps do I need to take to actually get there? And how can I leave this trauma? Or how can I have that trauma? And then I lead my entire decision as I get into the classroom. What can I say? What can I do? Um, How can I feel to make better decisions? What can I do? What can I say? Um, How can I help others understand me better? Because again, we're dealing with kids who have that choice, who have free reign. And these are not kids that are just going to do what we say to do. They're going to ask why, because we've taught them to ask why and how, and how can I improve and what needs to be done better. So it's, this is a, this is a 90% of my day thing. Um, And I, I have to teach teachers and others that they're not being defiant. They're not disobeying you. They're merely trying to get an understanding based on their experience, they're trying to mirror your experience to ultimately learn what you're trying to teach. That's really good. And just even to piggyback off of off of her point, mm-hmm. we in working with kids, we give kids excuses for those things because we know that their brains are not fully developed. Mm-hmm. So we know that there are studies that are saying that the prefrontal cortex, which controls the executive function, is not developed until that third decade of life. I'm like, man, I'm mm-hmm. just hitting that third decade a few years Wait ago. Minute. I told somebody a few weeks ago, because they're like, oh, I'm 24, I'm grown, blah, blah. I was like, your 20s are just teenage years part two. Yes. yes. <laughs> So we, we give we give kids grace, um, but once we become adults, we don't really give adults a lot of grace. Like it's like it's time to it's time to turn that trauma into something more positive or into something else because as an adult, we don't care about what you've been through. We are expecting you to perform just like everybody else. At an optimal level. But my thing is, mm-hmm. what if 
the trauma continued into your 20s and 30s and you're just beginning to work out of that because maybe you got married at the age of 25 and you were in an abusive relationship or something traumatic happened at 30. You know, you're not going to just switch off and be trauma th- trauma free at 37 mm-hmm. or 30. You know, so like you're saying, I do get that and there's a love of grace. At the same time, for me, I feel like at some point, when do we say, yes, this happened to me, but now I need to put in some some um, sweat equity and begin to chip away at this thing so it does not carry into my adulthood. And the reason why I ask this question is because um, within the Black church, mental health and things were taboo not discuss. We're just beginning to have these conversations. Mm-hmm. And so when you touch on the church thing, um, Antoine, in the last, I want to say mm, five years, where, I'm at, where I am spiritually has shifted because some of the traumas I experienced happened growing up in church, like being touched inappropriately. Mm-hmm. You know, even some of the rules and regulations, and I spent so much time, um, I would say from like 23 to my early 30s trying to fit in this box and follow all the rules Mm -hmm. and it was stressing me out because like oh I didn't wear this or just the Mm -hmm. little nitpicky things that happened with church and it was actually becoming like bondage to me and then when I moved and joined the military and I began and God began to show me yes there is an order you know as far as an etiquette but I'm looking at your relationship and your intimacy with me and once mm-hmm. I got that and learned relationship and not rules and regulation, because you cannot legislate right- righteousness by this list of wear your skirt like this. You can't, you know, the do's and the don'ts mm-hmm. and realizing how much more autonomy God really gives us. Because sometimes in the church, we are so hammered because I was raised, I'm third generation apostolic. So we were just nailed into us the fear of God and you going to hell, but nobody ever taught me the love of God. Mm-hmm. And so that's something I had to learn on my own within the last five to six years. Like, yes, you messed up. Yes, you did this. But I still love you. And my hand is on you. Yeah. And I favor you. And I cherish you. And when I began to get that, that that is what broke my heart. And I began to weep and worship because it's like, despite all the wrong things I've done, despite the times I missed the mark, he did not throw me away. Mm. The thought of that is what makes me cry, not because, you know, of what I wore or, you know, whatever, but just the in spite of. Mm -hmm. And if we teach that more, the relationship and love, yes, if, if you do something wrong, there are consequences. You have the right to choose and not to choose the consequence. I get it. But teaching the real love of God, hey, I might not agree with you, but I still need to treat with love, kindness and respect. And that ex in that aspect, because the word of God says, with love and kindness have I drawn you. Being your friend, being dependable, saying, Hey, Wick, I think you're dope. You're awesome. I know you had a rough day today, but girl, I'm rooting for you. I'm praying for you. That would attract you more than girl, you know those earrings that are, you know, like really. And we really mm-hmm. have to shift um how we are loving because sometimes what you could you call love is not love. And I think it's important to also realize that trauma can be taught. Yeah, trauma it's, is definitely, it's taught and it can be very generational. Yeah. And the way that we, the thing that separates us is how we respond to the trauma. Yes. Um, so quickly, mm. I worked at a community health clinic. And at that time, I think there was an earthquake in Haiti. Something had happened with Haiti. And there were a bunch of refugees that were coming yeah. to Atlanta from Haiti. These people had experienced immense trauma. They did not see it that way, though. Like, I saw their trauma as being something that should just devastate them. They shouldn't even be walking with a smile on their face. But the things that I saw as traumatizing, they did not see it as the same level of trauma. So the way that people respond to trauma differently, and that is what separates it. That's what makes it a gen- when we talk about generational curses, trauma is part of that. Yeah. Trauma is something that can be very generational. You will find families, um, even in my own family, I, I don't know if some of them watching, but <laughs> the, it's well, okay, <laughs> right, right, right. There's certain things 
in my family, and I think this is the case with a lot of Black families, because we've been silenced. We've been taught that our silence um, and to be quiet on things is is strength. And we what now goes know that this not. house stays in this house. Hey. Yeah, like we've been silenced for so long, especially black males, but I'm sure black females as well. How um, have black men been silenced, Antoine? I think we've been silenced, and we've talked about it a, a few times in different settings. But I think that there is a social construct of what a black male is meant to be and talking about your feelings and talking about the things that make you sad. It's just, it just doesn't fit into that social construct. It's like, I can't see you as the man, the provider and the leader when you are complaining about how you feel, but those complaints are valid. Those things are, those are real experiences that I'm experiencing and it's impacting me, but I'm not given a safe space to do that yeah, yeah. Um, without my strength being questioned. And, and a lot of that is either me questioning it myself because that's just mm-hmm. what I've been taught to do um, or society or my family questioning it. So I think that being silenced is it's not good. <laughs> it yeah. contributes to some of those same generational curses. Yeah, I like that. And um, I think it's important that us in the community, particularly with Black men, that we continue to have these conversations to say, hey, just because you open up and share your feelings, it doesn't take away from your identity. It's not an attack on your identity or who you are as a man. Like you said, those feelings are valid um, because you're human. If I cut you, you're going to bleed. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's unfair for women to, you know, we have so many sister circles, table talks and views and all the beauty shop, the salon and the nail shop. We have so many places to talk, but then men. um, And that's one of the reasons why, you know, with, the speaker podcast opening the door for black men to be here and to discuss and share their feelings to express. Um, Antoine, you've always been very vocal every time you come on here. And I wanted to open and say thank you for that because I think you showing up and representing the way you do shows, Hey, I can do this. And I'm still just as successful. I'm just as a man as I was before we had this conversation. And so having faces like yours here, I think it's encouraging to other brothers to say, hey, this is a safe space. Um, hey, brother, um, I see something's going on. Do you want to talk? And being the safe landing uh, safe landing space for another Black man, because um, you, you do need each other. You do need someone that you can have that feel like a vault. Like, I can tell you these mm-hmm. things and open up and be vulnerable with you, and it's not going to be weaponized against me later. Same things for Black women. Um, still, sometimes... Um, you think, oh, that's my my homegirl, that's my friend, and then you find out, you know, it was weaponized later. And and but I think it's more important, it's more imperative for black men to uh, be a safe space for each other. Um, and I think you're one of those people that that represents that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm showing all the teeth. <laughs> Pretty, that's that. Pretty, and yeah, and that's something I do want to. Um, if you want to continue that um area of discussion, but with the trauma as far as communication, because if you've had your trust violated as a child or as a young adult, mm-hmm. even being in a space to feel comfortable to open up to discuss your trauma, because that could be triggering within itself. Because a lot of times, statistically, the person that if that was your situation. That that trust was broken. It was by someone you trusted, right? Mm-hmm. And that can be triggering. Hmm. Um. And that that goes back to even the conversation about power, which you know is, is more of a therapy thing, but really working to regain the power back in those situations where you feel like you lost power. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you can apply that formula, because it's literally a formula. In every situation, like, okay, who is in charge? Who's in control? Um, And really being able to go through that formula, I think that that's a healthy exercise. That's that's literally how I look at everything. It goes back to selfishness. When I say that I'm selfish, I always look at, is this going to benefit me? I do things that benefit me that benefit other people all the time. 
Wow. Because I like to give to other people. So by giving to someone else, that's benefiting me, even though this mm-hmm. other person is a byproduct, but it's still pouring into my cup. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah. that I you know, unapologetically make those kind of decisions because I have to take care of myself. We are our biggest advocates. Like, it's not your mama. It's not your kids. You are literally your biggest advocate. Like, nobody is going to advocate. Nobody should be advocating for you more than you're advocating for yourself. Right. And if that's not the case, Mm -hmm. then that's an issue. (laughs) I love it. Dr. Witt? Um. You froze. You're frozen. I believe my speech was right. And so, what about now? No. Yeah, we were a little choppy. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, One of the things that I I had to teach my children, not because I wasn't taught, because I just didn't pick up on it, was advocating for them as a child. Now, Mm -hmm. in the Black community, though, what does that look like? If you're asking questions, if you are, you know, giving commentary, um, it's you are being disrespectful. You are talking back. You're not being in a child's place. And so advocating is something that we do heavily in my house. And it, it it's it's quite it's quite a feat because my children are very strong willed. And so when you have strong willed advocating for themselves. Um, I used to do this thing called convince me. So if I say I want a BB done, let's go kitchen, clean the kitchen. I may think the kitchen needs to be clean in 30 minutes. It should take you 30 minutes to clean it thoroughly. Um, they'll come in and say, hey, mom, I think I can get this done more efficiently if I go this route. And it'll only take me about 20 minutes. What do you think if I try this? Now, Diane and William would not have gone for that. If they say it's going to take 30 minutes, it's going to take 30 minutes. And that's what you're going to do. We need, I, I like to practice. Okay, let's let's see what you're doing. Let's research it. Is it going to be effective for you? Is it going to give me the results that I want? Okay, if it does, I love it. Let's go with it. And so I teach them to do that when they go out into public spaces. But it's not always received because, again, they're very strong-willed. They're going to say it with a straight face, a, a little emotion, because not everything deserves a big emotional reaction. It's just, hey, I think we should try it this way. Hey, let's do this instead of this to adults. So advocating, accountability, all of that, something that we push every Sometimes it works. Sometimes, you know, I, I go full mama bear and I push it to the side and I advocate for them. But that's one thing that I, I really appreciate. One thing that I really try to do um, heavily in all spaces. So, is that a question for me? I guess I'm mean, anyone um, says, Do you feel this generation is too emotional? There is a lot of sensationalism. Um, I think mm-hmm. there's, this generation is very passionate when warranted. Um, I think sometimes I have noticed on social media there is a lot of hypersensitivity when something mm-hmm. is maybe just here and then it's taken all the way to the upper echelon of sensationalism. So what do you guys think about that in terms of the emotionalism of this generation and how that ties into everything we've been talking about? Yes. (laughs) Yes. I don't, I don't like how we, I, I like to be real and I like to have honest conversation. And I feel like, In this current space that we're in, we can't do as much of that. That in certain spaces that you're in, you have to really dance around certain topics because you don't want to offend anybody um, or you don't want to use the wrong words. And I I don't like that. Like, I just, I like when we were able just to say how we feel. Um, And and of course, that had its issues. So that, that wasn't always the best thing. But I do feel like, By doing that, we were able to get to the bottom of things um, a little bit better. Like now it's just if I'm not in my safe space with, you know, my my circle, I may not share certain things. I may not share in the same way because I don't want to come across, you know, negatively. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think um, 
we have a lot of options and we have a lot of layers and we have a lot of opinions. And so it does, it does tend to make them a bit more emotional. But again, we're coming from people who were taught to suppress. So as we suppress Mm -hmm. a lot of things, these people have the option to not do that. So for us, it's like, oh, you're blowing that way out of proportion. But for them, it is a big matter because we've taught them that it's okay to make those little things a big thing. Mm -hmm. Something I think Antoine brought it up as far as um, previous generations and and kind of touching on what you said, Dr. Wet, and it's like this generation, our generations, the first generation uh, being allowed to explore healing and even pursue that because the generations before us were too busy fighting off the Klan, Jim Crow, you know, getting on the bus. And here we are. Um, yes, we are dealing with other things in our society, but, you know, if we decided to get on the airplane, we don't have to sit in the back. We can sit in first class, you know, so just some other social pressures and and choices that were not necessarily a day-to-day decision, like water fountains and things like that. We don't deal with that. So because that is not on us directly, we do have the option to have these conversations and discuss trauma, if it's growing up in church and dealing with that trauma, talking about, you know, reclaiming our power, walking in our power, using our voices, being, uh, as you, Antoine, um, a Black man, being able to express his feelings. Like, you couldn't, who who was doing that 20 years ago? You know, it was just, you go to work, make sure that, you know, your family has something to eat, you keep the lights on, and you watch the new tea fellowship in the chair, you know? And so now that we can have these conversations, not only just between women, but now bringing Black men into the conversation and saying, hey, my brother, how do you feel about that? What do you think about that? How are you doing today? Like, that's unheard of, you know, from the previous generation. Yeah, I I completely agree. Um, And I think that it's a good thing. I think that our generation has been very disruptive Mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. I try not to, although I don't know if it comes across this way, I try not to talk too negatively about the generation before us because they did their job, just like you said. They they had a different fight, um, and their fight is different than our fight. Uh, We're not fighting, to to your point, you know, to sit in a certain part of the bus. Uh, We're still fighting for equal rights, let's let's be clear. Um, But we're not fighting for it the way that they are. So they had a different fight, and that just required them. That just, it changed the way that they look at the world. Um, So I can't fault them for that. They did what they knew to do and what they were told to do. Um, In our generation, we just don't do that. We are very disruptive. We do what we want to do, and we uh, reject the things that we don't want to do. Yeah, and then... Um, also hats off and flowers to um, those that came before us because I cannot imagine life, you know, at being all. a child walking to school and I have adults screaming at me, calling me names or yeah. you know, waking up with a noose at my door. Like that's a whole nother level of stress and trauma, you know, just to even yeah. go to the store, you know, and saying, hey, walk down this street. Don't go by this house, you know, say yes, mm-hmm. ma'am, no, ma'am. And mm-hmm. then not having a cell phone to make sure your child made it safely or that your spouse right. made it safely. Like two, two weeks ago, I went to uh, D.C. to the African American Museum and they had uh, an exhibit. It was very interactive. It was called Follow the Green Book. And at this uh, exhibit, they had an old Hudson. It was like a dark green color. And then when you walk around it, there was this computer like board monitor and then the windshield was like a video screen. And so the challenge was you were living in Chicago and you had to make it to Alabama to see your grandmother without incident. And so every time you got to a stop, it would say, follow the green book. And you had to tap the green book and it would tell you, hey, these are the places that you can eat or get gas or hotel and be safe. And just in playing this interactive game, it was nerve wracking. It was nerve wracking. Yeah, I could, I could. I'm glad that I was in the time that I was in. God knew what he was born. I was born at the right time. Yes, <laughs> my dad actually, um, my dad integrated a school um, in what? his hometown. Wow. Right, so I was. I'm thinking like, why is education so important to both him and my mom? My mom's a little bit younger, but why is education so important? Well, 
his daddy couldn't read. Like he didn't have the option of learning to read. He was in the field. But my daddy, literally, you know, all the stuff that you hear about on the movies and books, he experienced. I mean, it was for a wow. year, but it shifted his entire. He's like, you got to go to school. You have to do this. This is why it's important. So every day, like clockwork, um, walk at the house. Let's do this homework. Let's do these. Let's read this book. Let's start it out or not. Like education was top tier in my house. There was nothing higher. <laughs> nothing except Jesus. And, you know, Jesus in education. <laughs> you know that uh, Dick Gregory said back in the day, um, all black people knew how to do was call on Jesus in the NAACP. <laughs> <laughs> And here we are. Look, one of the two of them were going to come through. <laughs> R.I.P. to Mr. Dick Gregory because he told no tales, okay? <laughs> but no. yeah, so yeah. all jokes aside, uh, Dr. Whit, that's amazing. I can only imagine um, the, the just the tales, the stories, reflect reflections your father could tell if we were to sit down and talk to him. That's That's I can't even imagine because we think about our grandparents, maybe, but not our parents. So that's that's mm -hmm. dope right there. Yeah. Shout out to your dad. Um, and before we wrap things up, um, because we are at the hour mark, did either one of you want to leave a jewel or nugget before uh, we all come back for another conversation? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, I think a healthy exercise that I always tell clients to do. Um, and this is something that I do. Uh, our priorities in life change. So what, what is my priority now may be different than what was a priority a year from now. Um, so I think that's something that's important to do is to just kind of write down what you did for the day for several days in a row. Um, and then once you get to the end of that week, really look at that list and evaluate, okay, what are my priorities now? And if I'm saying that my priority is one thing, but I'm spending all of my time doing another thing, how do I reconcile that? I think that's a very healthy exercise. When I do it myself, it's always amazing that I will say you know, these are my priorities, but then I realized that my time is not matching up with my priorities. That goes into what we were talking about in terms of social media. Um, that goes into what we were talking about in terms of power. Yeah. So I think that that's a healthy exercise that I would encourage anybody to do just to see what you come up with. I think you would really shock yourself. That's really good. And also, before we uh, go to Dr. Witt, Anton, did you have? Um, any products or things you wanted to plug, events, and then also where can people find you on social media? Yes, people can find me on social media. My personal social media is AG Aiken. Um, I also have a nonprofit foundation, the Aiken Foundation, um, that I really think I'm going to start doing some more mental health stuff with because okay. it, it doesn't make sense for me to um, you know, have this this gift that I feel is a gift from God and not really give it to people in a different way outside of clinical settings. So. Yeah, I think uh, with you, that would be a very nice direction because we do need more brothers in this space to speak up because uh, you are a good black man because I was <laughs> not bad. Y'all exist. Y'all are out there. Y'all go get that. Um, <laughs> for sure. Um, and if you have an event or something, let me know. I'll scoot on down to yes. kind of 85 South. Y'all know me. I'll come to Atlanta in a minute. So You will. <laughs> you know, I support my people in the A. Um, I'm like a honorary resident of Atlanta. <laughs> you are. You will come in a second. <laughs> Part B. All right, <laughs> Dr. Witt. Um, takeaways, and then where can people find you on social media? Is she frozen? I think so. Oh, yeah. Looks like she is. Frozen chosen. All right. Hopefully, she'll come back around. Um, if she has not, please follow Dr. Witt. She is on Instagram. You can follow her um, right there. There's her handle at Dr. Spill out the word Dr. Witt, the letter M. I think she is back. Let's see what happens. Hopefully, she's working. Hey. Okay, I don't know what happened, but I'm back. 
Okay. Yeah, we're just asking you just for a takeaway and then where people can find you on social media. Okay. Yeah. Um, at Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R with M um, on Instagram, Whitney McCurry on Facebook. Uh, I think the same handle for Twitter. Um, okay. Healing can begin when you're ready. Um, it, there's, it doesn't have to be a big, a big anything for you to begin your healing journey. Um, and so we all have trauma. We all have traumas that we are working through. Um, no one is different from you. It's not you alone. It's you also. So when you're ready to begin, go for it. Take the first step. Find your, th- find your therapist. You know, if you don't have insurance, find someone who accepts a sliding scale or someone. There are some free resources in every community that I've been in or close to. So when you're ready, just go. I absolutely love it. This has been a great conversation. I definitely want to have um, the both of you back uh, just because you are so easy to talk to, a lot of fun, and you also bring a lot of knowledge and value to the conversation. So I want to say thank you, Dr. Witt and Antoine, uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule because this is summer summer, and we are outside. Antoine, I know you've been outside. So- <laughs> <Self-care>. <laughs> you stay outside. You stay outside. Well, I've been outside. <laughs> So, um, right. about to go back, but um, <laughs> thank you so much to the both of you. Um, also to everyone, if you haven't heard, um, I have launched uh, chemistry room fragrances. So if you go right now, shop at my website. It's there on the screen. Use the coupon code GBM15. That way, as a first time subscriber, you can save fifteen percent at the checkout. The fragrance of the evening as lavender and vanilla. You are absolutely going to love it. So please go and grab that right now. And also follow Chemistry. We are on Instagram as well at Chemistry Maroon Fragrances. I would love to hear from you. Um, so you can shoot me an email. Uh, my information uh, is info at Camille.essex. Grab it there. And also subscribe to my YouTube, YouTube channel. So with that being said, everyone, I hope you did get something from this conversation tonight. This is your girl, Camille Essex, host of the Speaker Podcast. This is the podcast where innovators and creators connect. Thank you so much and good night. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Speak Her Podcast. Be sure to follow Camille on Instagram at Camille.essic, Facebook at the Speak Her Podcast, or www.camilleessic.com.